I guess it goes without saying that if you've watched this channel even a small amount, you'll probably notice that I cover a lot of competitive Mortal Kombat, from all the way back in 1992 to right now with MK11. I've spent a lifetime with this game as a fan, but I've always had this intense fascination with the competitive side of it. I used to be a top-level player back in the day, and now I commentate large events whenever they happen, and obviously I do a ton of video essays on all things MK tournaments. But one thing I've always wanted to do, but never actually done, is sit down with the overall cast of this franchise and put together a strong argument for which characters in tournament are overall the most powerful that we've ever seen. Now I'm not talking about specific games here, we can go on about MK9 Cabal and MKX Pre-Patch Alien all we want, but I want to go bigger than that. Which characters have had the highest concentration of top or high tier placements across all of their games? That's what I want to dive into today. Now if you've watched my recent competitive history, you already know who I think is the number one across every game. But my point is, it wasn't an easy choice and simply aided by the final version of MK11. The question is, what other characters were in the running and how do they work? Well, that's for today's video to explain where my name is Ketchup and these are who I consider to be the overall most powerful characters in 30 years of Mortal Kombat. To start with, I want to lay down some personal ground rules. Hopefully, this will help you understand my thought process here, and obviously, a lot of people in the comments are probably going to have their own opinions, which is totally fine. I am prioritizing characters that have had what I consider to be many playable appearances over the years. We can look at characters who have been really strong in every appearance, but if they've only been playable like twice, it's not really fair to add them into my list, seeing as other characters have arguably had more top tier appearances, but due to being in more games have also had low tier entries, which would have hindered their chances of being on my list. I'm going for long term cast members here, and hopefully after this video is over, you'll understand why. This isn't really a set numbered list by the way, this is every character I consider overall the most powerful. It will be as big or short as it needs to be, but obviously the final character is my number one. Here's a cool way to start things off. Smoke, both robot and human, but I'll be combining them for the sake of this video. Smoke has had a fair few appearances from the 90s to now and always makes some kind of lasting impact. There has genuinely never been a time in history where robot or human smoke has been low tier. The character's been high or mid tier at the absolute lowest. And let's break down all of the appearances and I will simply explain why. Vanilla MK3 was Robot Smoke, and it was in the top half of the game's tier list. On top of being the game's secret fighter, which is pretty cool, this game didn't have all of the ninjas and stuff, so the tricky matchups that Robot had were not even present here. But Vanilla MK3 also saw characters like Sub Zero, Cyrax, or Jax being way more powerful than an Ultimate. Ultimate MK3 changes things, and this is where the real significance began. Robo Smoke was still by far the strongest of the robot characters, but it was the secret human smoke that stood out in this version. Simply a better version of Scorpion with great movement, mobility, insanely high combo damage, and a launcher that starts from a kick string that can be used to plow through enemy defense. Smoke would be regarded as number one in this game, if not for Cabal, but we'll get to him later. Human Smoke is still considered top tier in MK Trilogy. Believe it or not, we wouldn't see Smoke till way later with MK Deception. Yeah, Smoke was partnered with Noob Cybot here, but look, Noob Smoke was often regarded as top three. Not necessarily due to their own individual merits though, the character really just abused the new to deception mechanics like OTG combos from a throw, free throws on wake up, and stuff like that. Smoke's throw in this game was one of the most unreal because you could loop it to obnoxious effect, and this was definitely another top tier placement. For Armageddon, there isn't much to say. Smoke is standalone and a pretty decent character with high practical damage, but doesn't have the exploitable grab stuff from Deception as all of that was removed here. Smoke was incredibly strong, but there were definitely better characters in Armageddon. MK9 was the next time we saw Smoke and had a toolkit that many would consider absolutely broken. 
But this game was so broken that Smoke wasn't even top 5, if you'd believe it. However, the character was still more than tournament viable due to evasiveness, counter zoning, overall utility, and we have to mention the broken reset combos. Smoke could loop multiple combos in one if timed correctly and had true touch of death potential. A very strong appearance. MKX is currently the end of the line for Smoke, but the Smoke variation of Triborg has always been powerful. Smoke was kind of misunderstood back on launch because of the other variations of Triborg having so much source, but Smoke was a vortex machine, had some of the best defensive specials in the game due to the true invincibility on meter burn evade, loads of conversion potential, and even a scary mid-game due to the extended options of forward 4, including unique buttons that come from back 2. Now the forward 4 extensions were something that only Smoke had by the way. This character was a mixture of Robot Smoke and MK9 Smoke, and it was so much fun, but also highly successful in the world of tournament play. There is often a discussion over which Triborg variation was better, Smoke or Sector, and everyone has their reasons for either or, but both of them are top tier, and Smoke is one of the most reliable picks you could go for in competitive MKX, even now. Now a character with no low tier placements, one mid tier and the others high or top tier, Smoke is a memorable fighter across the years and has consistently been viable and very dangerous. Reptile is next on my list because of just how many playable versions we've had, but with so many of them being strong at the very least, he takes his rightful place in today's video. Mortal Kombat 2 is his first version, and unfortunately many competitive MK2 heads would say that he's the weakest in the game. His main move in Force Ball is jumpable on reaction, so he doesn't have the same level of safety as other picks, and it's unfortunate, but this would be the last time ever that Reptile was actually a low-tier character. Ultimate MK3 changed Reptile so much where the mobility, damage and utility would amplify a great deal. Reptile is possibly the hardest character to use at high level, but with touch of death combos, infinites against some of the cast, slide to punish certain moves, some of the best overall zoning thanks to force balls, invisibility and lightning fast repositioning with running serpent, Reptile is one of the stronger characters in the game, he just takes a ton of work to use properly. Note that Reptile is considered a bit weaker in Trilogy due to the game speed changes and, with N64 being the version of choice, resulting in slightly choppy performance, making him even harder to use well. Reptile is one of the strongest characters in Mortal Kombat 4. He once again has a decent moveset, but this time doesn't really play like the Reptile that we know and love. He's actually quite boring, but with the speed of some of his specials, he is a rather volatile pick. The most notable feature is his weapon, which may look like a simple battle axe, but due to the ability to cancel its launcher's recovery with block, Reptile can actually infinite you with this weapon until max damage forcefully breaks it. It is very broken indeed. Deadly Alliance tends to be a game that has Reptile roughly in the top 3, behind Bo Raicho and Scorpion, but with characters like Dramin in this game as well, the actual top 3 is a bit up in the air depending on who you talk to. Reptile has amazing utility in all three stances, which is quite rare, amazing stance moves like a reversal for instance, but also just has this incredible hit and run style game thanks to short attack recovery, made even shorter in that most of his good buttons can be backdash cancelled a technique that worked in Deadly Alliance and Deception. Now he's got low overhead mix for days in this game and is unbelievably safe. You can actually learn how to play him rather quickly because of his simplicity, however his toolkit is so useful that Reptile plays Deadly Alliance better than most. Reptile's totally different in Armageddon, but he's still pretty good, mostly because he has decent damage, but most notably an invisibility move. In 3D Mortal Kombat, invisibility was true invisibility, so anyone that had this was automatically quite dangerous, and Reptile was made much better because of it. He's not top tier in this game, but he's not bad either, and in Armageddon, that is sometimes all you can ask for. MK9 saw Reptile as a decent character to say the least. He was simply overshadowed by some of the god tiers, which is unfortunately a tale that many characters in MK9 have in common. He had really good zoning, great combo damage, and decent pressure up close. He was actually a nightmare to fight if you weren't super versed in the matchup, however he just wasn't a top 5 pick, 
and some might say barely outside of the top 10, or perhaps just in it. It really depends on who you ask once again. But Reptile was a strong character for sure. But there were definitely more overwhelming characters overall, and that was the problem. That didn't stop Reptile from being a character that could fight a lot of the cast by himself though. MKX is Reptile's current final version, and believe it or not, he is once again a strong character. Many characters in this game were by the final version, and he's got great variety. There's a lot of character specialists that can get the work done here, and overall just show us how good he can be in the right hands. He's a bit awkward to play at the highest level, but Reptile is, again, a strong pick in this game, marking Reptile's overall placements once again rather on the high end, don't you think? Besides, I suppose his very first version. Sonya Blade is one that has a serious argument for maybe even being the overall strongest, as she's had many versions that are immensely powerful, even being the very first broken Mortal Kombat character in the franchise's history. Mortal Kombat in 1992 had Sonya clear and above the strongest character. She had a weird hurt box, good buttons, a fast projectile, stuff in older games that just makes a character way more annoying to fight basically, but her most obnoxious tool was her leg grab special. It was great by itself anyway, but for anyone that has even followed competitive MK1 a little bit will know, this was just the start of it. The most useful tool that this move had was the ability to take advantage of a bug that this game featured, where if you you get hit out of an attack, aka a counter hit to many of us these days, the opponent can't block for a few frames while standing back up. Sonya's leg grab would catch them during these frames and actually infinite until the round was over. Broken, 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 no fun to fight, but oh my lord, so powerful. MK3 and Ultimate MK3 both had Sonya as a powerful pick, and in UMK3 specifically, she had the relaunch possibilities and the existence of more launch potential with her combo strings, which helped out many characters if they had a tool like that. Sonya just had an amazing tool set in this game where there's kind of a bit of everything here. Her buttons overall were pretty damn good, her kick strings that can counter low pokes during pressure lead to impressive damage, and even on block wasn't too bad either. Her special moves would include a projectile, the square wave, a leg grab, and now a rising bicycle kick, which to this day is an absolute pain in the backside to try and punish sometimes. Sonya is rarely a character that people actually talk about when looking at Ultimate MK3 in general. I think most people talk about Cabal, Human Smoke, Ermac, you know, the really common top tier characters, but Sonya is pretty much always in a player's top 10 for this game. Not as good as the absurd number one of the first game, but still very impressive here. MK4 is most likely Sonya's most forgettable appearance, where she often resides in the mid-tier of many a tier list you can find online. She basically keeps all of her old moves, and they function the same way. But in a game like this, where combo strings are universal, on a base level every character plays pretty similar. None of these moves are in a broken sense that will put a character into a higher placement of a tier list, but a notable new inclusion is the very first version of her cartwheel that would ever see. Now this move does have fast recovery, and it can lead to more combo potential. It's actually one of her standout moves when playing MK4, but it is similar in function to perhaps a Tanya drill or something. It just doesn't have the same level of reward should it connect. Sonya isn't terrible in this game, but she's pretty average, which is why Mortal Kombat 4 tends to mark her lowest placement overall. Deadly Alliance skyrockets Sonya's power from MK4, where here she is one of the best characters with some of the scariest rushdown in the game. Almost all of it is tied to Taekwondo in connection with her Kali sticks. The strings and buttons this hand-to-hand -hand provides when stance swapped into the weapon gives her overhead low mix-up with amazing pressure. Deadly Alliance is a game most notable for its footsies and a much more grounded gameplay of all of the 3D titles, and Sonya is one of the more fundamental mentally strongest characters at being able to do just that. This is one of those appearances where she just plays the game really well, and due to her varied toolkit and ability to get scary pressure and mix-ups simply makes her a top 5 character. When people look at the strongest characters in this game, it does tend to be a mix of Bo Raicho, Scorpion, Reptile, Dramin, and of course, Sonya.
Armageddon changes Sonya a little bit, where she's basically a more dumbed-down version of Deadly Alliance. By this point, Taekwondo had been given to Nightwolf in Deception, which was a butchered version of the stance. It was way more unsafe. The Deception version of the stance was given back to Sonya in Armageddon, and it keeps the weaker toolset. Some other stuff was taken away from Sonya as well, as back four into the sticks no longer works, hindering that low and overhead mix-up considerably. She's given a few new moves that she didn't have in Deadly Alliance, but none of them hugely help her out. She's just a more limited version of her Deadly Alliance self, where even backdash cancelling was fully removed in Armageddon, so the safety on anything tends to be a lot weaker. As far as Sonya goes in this game, she's alright, but she's not super standout like the top tiers. Her best 3D form is definitely Deadly Alliance. Now, the only character to appear in Mortal Kombat vs. DC in this list, and one that in tier lists I can find online is said to be pretty good. I keep seeing her in roughly the top 10 area, and I will be honest here, this game is hard to research. You have to really sift through ancient forum posts to find info on certain characters, especially ones that aren't immediately out there as top tier, like a Green Lantern or a Flash or something. There's loads to read about them, but I guess those characters were a bit more of an interesting conversation back in the day. Either way, Sonya's combo game was pretty impressive, and she seemed to have had a few strings that were safe on block. The mix-up potential lied in mid, low, or throw with buttons that recovered pretty quickly and allowed her to keep the opponent on their toes. Now, one thing is, you can find a Kiss of Death infinite if the opponent is against the wall, but it's kind of hard to really talk about this stuff too much. The game had so much busted stuff in it that, yeah, this was there. It was a lot more dependent on where they were against the wall, though, and could easily break if you weren't in the right position. But the thing is, like, Lex Luthor had an infinite against the wall, too, and he was one of the worst characters in the game. Either way, Sonya is in a lot of high-tier placements for this game, but never right at the top. Mortal Kombat 9 is possibly her most infamous, as she's undisputed top 5 and has what many see to be the best rushdown in the entire game. She has mix-up tools for days, a majorly broken armoured cartwheel reversal, and has other amazing tools like a military stance that makes her already broken down 4 low poke even more broken and even a dive kick that gives her full combos and can be strange to punish at certain ranges. She has matchups that are completely one-sided, the ability to low profile thanks to a broken down fall with military stance, and amazing combos that seem to always end in a restand, and that will eliminate the opponent's wake-up options. It's one of the scariest rushdown examples in almost any Mortal Kombat at this point, and due to so many moving parts that makes her a complete character, Sonya is one of the strongest characters in the entire run. Foster. MKX is another almost infamous appearance, as no matter the version of the game, she was a character that many people enjoyed to use and saw a lot of tournament success. Early on, it was Covert Ops, which, although was a nightmare to block against in the old delay-based netcode before MKXL, the less we say about that the better, was still strong offline in a number of examples. The real variation that sent Sonya over the top was Demolition, and the almost unblockable nature that her mix-ups provided thanks to grenade drops. It was almost a running joke back then that you can't block forever against this variation. At some point, you're gonna guess wrong, and she's gonna get a full combo into a free reload. Dropping grenades made it almost impossible to press buttons against, because again, she was such a one-player character that once that grenade was on the screen, you were in deep trouble. This was another example where Sonya was frighteningly powerful and felt like the biggest mix-up machine that we'd seen from her yet. And even then, Demolition granted some great defensive options that made turning the tables a bigger risk than most characters. MK11 is her final stop, and she's one of the examples where she didn't really get super duper nerfed or anything. I mean, yeah, she did get some changes, but Sonya's overall threat simply got lower the more people learned the game. She had a really good overhead low mix-up in the corner thanks to Ringmaster, as she could cancel the charged energy ring. And that was definitely something that Sonya players kept using when custom variations were introduced. 
but she didn't really change much with customs. The more people learned the game, the better they became at dealing with Sonya, either her zoning or rushdown options. And there really wasn't much left to develop for her once players had hit a certain point. Don't get me wrong, there's a decent amount of great, successful Sonya players still to this day. But in this one, she's not really a character that anyone discusses when looking at top tiers. She's one of the true characters that had simply fallen off after a certain period of time, being overshadowed by other characters from that point onwards. Now, Sonya's consistency with overwhelming top tier presence across the years, coupled with just how many games she's actually been playable, made her a strong contender in today's list. And if MK11 had gone a bit differently, perhaps, she'd be right up there in discussion over number one, potentially. I think before I break down my final character, I have to give an honourable mention, because there are characters who have been consistently good in their appearances, there's just not enough games to make it a fair fight, if you will. Dramin comes to mind straight away, because he's top tier in both of his appearances. He's straight up broken in Deadly Alliance because his zoning is unfair. His backdash is strange as hell because it's basically two backdashes in one, making him nearly impossible to chase. Add backdash cancelling on top of that and he's not unsafe either. He is a one stance character because he is exclusively an iron club, so you can't use reversals against him. And he has a power up that turns a simple fly ball, ground pound and uppercut into a 70% damage combo. Stupid, stupid, utterly stupid character, and uh, not that fair. By the way, he was still amazing in Armageddon, as he had mix-up, damage, and safety. More moves overall than Deadly Alliance, which doesn't say much as he barely had moves in that game, but he's still incredible here regardless. He's a different experience, but he keeps a lot of stuff that makes him a threat. Mix-up, combos, damage, a bit of zoning, and he still has the ground pound. In Armageddon, he's simple but oh so effective, and this marks two games and two absolute top-tier placements. There are other characters you could potentially add from the 3D era, Dairu or Cobra perhaps come to mind, but their future appearances would be a bit more up in the air. The one character that has consistency here is Dramin. And the final character who I absolutely think takes the top spot overall as the strongest in 30 years of Mortal Kombat, and one that you might already know if you watched my recent competitive history. That character is Cabal. I went over this character in great detail a mere few weeks ago, but allow me to give you the short version, because he is a cut above the rest, make no mistake. Vanilla MK3 was the first appearance, and Cabal would have been number one, if not for unmasked Sub-Zero being so broken in this one. Cabal's moveset would majorly help in his power, and in this version exclusively, could use his buzzsaw attack after a spin for some really high combo damage, on top of much easier arcade runs, but that's not as important here. Ultimate MK3 turned things up to 11 because now, although the buzzsaw after spin was taken away and his main dialer combo had received less damage, he had access to relaunches that worked on a fair few characters. Cabal in this game was simply the perfect character who had amazing jabs, a super amazing nomad dash, and importantly, instant air gas blasts that zoned out a good portion of the roster. Cabal was the definition of overwhelming in this game and this was merely just the beginning. Deception was Cabal's 3D debut, and he was super cheap in this game as well. He was one of the characters that could take full advantage of the broken Deception mechanics, such as OTGs and free throws. His combo damage was on the higher end of a lot of characters, and he had wonderful mobility thanks to weapon stance and its fast walk speed and large sidesteps. Some things I actually didn't know about at the time of making his competitive history was that he even had access to gas blast and spin combos if you spaced them correctly. He had tons of ways to get free hits, OTGs, and all round just a super duper cheap character. Armageddon was his weaker appearance, and it included a much weaker weapon stance. The old hook swords from Deception were given to Movado in this one. However, he was still solid in this game. He just served as a stripped down Deception version. Some stuff I once again did not mention in his competitive history was an airborne 333 infinite. And thank you very much to Czech, the 3DMK god, for enlightening me there. But overall, Cabal was still a capable pick. He was just pretty average for his one and only time.
MK9 was the example that many people remember, because it felt a bit like Ultimate MK3 Cabal, but so much scarier. The pure fundamentals of rushdown and pressure, combined with fantastic zoning, translated in full to his MK9 version. MK9 Cabal lost zero matchups and demolished most of the cast. Whether he was just completely shredding them up close with dash cancels and chip damage, or used his instant air gas blast and zero frame startup buzzsaw to zone you out all round long. He was a character who didn't care if he had the infamous player one advantage, cared even less if you tried to pick a stage more favourable for your character, and had everything a top tier character in MK9 could ever want. MK9 Cabal is one of the most busted characters in the history of competitive Mortal Kombat. MK11 Cabal, although went through an interesting journey of starting off mid-tier in the more restricted versions, to now being in the discussion of top 5 due to a ridiculous custom variation that pretty much fixed Cabal's biggest flaws in the game. Originally, Cabal got outzoned pretty heavily, as strange as that sounds, but ever since MK11 Ultimate and custom variations, he can use his air dash ability to close in space like never before, paired with obnoxiously good jump ins. This version of Cabal has a frighteningly good jump game and a more than impressive basic combo damage game. Ever since this variation hit the scene, it has been used to full effect in Tournament, where Cabal is way more common in this game than he's ever been, and it has even been used by players like the famous Chilean twins Scorpion Prox and Nicholas. They used it to win events like Evolution last year, Cabal in MK11 officially taking a title of a World Championship capable character. Now, I have to admit, it wasn't an easy choice deciding on who my number one character is. We have countless games and countless appearances to choose from, where it came down to one tiny factor, and that truly was final version of MK11. I was so close to having either Sonya or maybe even Smoke as my pick for strongest character, but the moment MK11 Ultimate hit the scene and Cabal was once again terrorizing online and offline competition, it just makes you look back on the fact that this character's never had a single bad appearance in his life, and in most cases is always causing some kind of mayhem due to broken tools or something. It is the sheer overwhelming power of Cabal in a lot of appearances that decided things for me, and I hope that today's video was able to somewhat break down some of that. Thank you all so much for watching. As always, let me know in the comments which characters you think should have been up there, and I'll see you next time. Take care.